Europa is the biggest moon of Jupiter, the huge ocean beneath the surface. The satellite's water under a huge layer of ice does not freeze because of the hot core of Europa, which is heated by Jupiter's gravity. This became known in the early 2000s thanks to the Galileo probe, which detected marks of an electrically conductive liquid under the surface of Europa. It also discovered that the surface is made of ice and that it's one of the smoothest in the solar system. It might seem that this is where our knowledge ends, but this is not true. Over the past 20 years, and especially recently, we have learned a lot of exciting details about this distant satellite. We offer to ponder on some of them and reflect on to what degree this distant world can be alive. So Europa, also known as Jupiter 2, is the sixth moon of Jupiter, the smallest of the four Galilean satellites. It was discovered in 1610 by Galileo Galilei. Over the centuries, more and more comprehensive observations of Europe were made with telescopes and since the 70s of the 20th century with flying spacecraft. Europa is slightly smaller than the Moon. With a diameter of 3,122 kilometers, it is the sixth in size among satellites and the 15th among all objects in the solar system. It is the smallest of the Galilean satellites, yet the mass of Europa is greater than all known satellites in the solar system that are inferior in size combined. Its average density is very low, and this points to the fact that it consists mainly of silicate rocks and thus is similar in composition to the terrestrial planets. However, it's not a dead object. Even now, scientists indicate geysers, which eject large amounts of water into the atmosphere of Europe in the form of steam. It is known that water molecules emit certain frequencies of infrared light as they interact with solar radiation. This signal was captured by the Keck Observatory scientists who found it using the spectrograph. It was designed to measure the chemical composition of planets' atmospheres. The observations were held for 17 nights. During that period, the scientists detected one weak yet clear water stream signal. The analysis of the data showed that the ejection of the water molecules on Europa occurred on the site visible from Jupiter. According to the researchers' calculations, the blowout was so powerful and it contained so much water that it could fill an Olympic pool in just several minutes. Water entered the atmosphere at a rate of about 2,360 liters per second. If the dwellers of Europe were in that stream, that would have been their last attraction. The good news is, those inhabitants who would manage not to be blown to the outer space would be very easy to find, as the surface of Europe is one of the flattest in the solar system. The tallest formations that can be found here are merely several hundred meters. If we take a close look at Europa's surface images, we will see signs of endogenous geological activity, such as lines, lenticles, bumps and pits, and the so-called Connemara cows below the center. The high albedo of the satellite indicates that the surface of the ice is pretty clean and young. It is believed that the cleaner the ice on the surface of the icy satellites, the younger it is. Let's also pay attention to the plains. Smooth plains can be formed by the activity of cryovolcanoes, which erupt to the surface, filling areas with spreading and hardening water. From Europa's orbit, we can see a chaotic relief that has different geometric shapes. We can also observe areas which are dominated by lines and stripes, ridges, usually doubled, as well as impact craters. Their number is small. There are only 40 named craters over 5 kilometers in diameter, which suggests that the surface is relatively young, from 20 to 180 million years old. So Europe has high geological activity. The spectral analysis of the dark lines and spots of the structure shows presence of salts, magnesium sulfate in particular. The reddish hue allows to assume the presence of iron and sulfur compounds as well. Apparently, they are contained in the ocean of Europa and are ejected to the surface through clefts and then freeze. In addition, 
traces of hydrogen peroxide and strong acids were found. For instance, there is a high chance that Europa contains sulfuric acid hydrate. Let's land on that interesting object. As it turns out, it's not that easy. The thing is, Jupiter's moon Europa is surrounded by a region of sharp ice needles which stretches along the entire equator and is extremely dangerous for space probes to land on. Ice needles, also known as calgospores in Europa, can reach up to 15 meters in height. Large as they are, these structures still cannot be seen on the images of Europe available to us so far. A few careful maneuvers and we landed. Phew, we managed not to damage our spacecraft by this gigantic icicle. The incredible view of Europe opens to our eyes. Its surface is very cold compared to the Earth. The temperature here is 150-190 degrees Celsius below zero. But that is not the main thing to worry about here. The radiation level on Europe is extremely high, as the satellite's orbit passes through the powerful radiation belt of Jupiter. The daily dose of radiation here is nearly a million times bigger than on Earth. This dose is enough to cause severe radiation sickness. But no worries, we have a proper radiation protection. At least, we hope so. Well, with this in mind, we are sending a tunnel robot with a nuclear reactor into the deep of Europe that could drill ice while collecting ice and water samples and sending information to the surface via fiber optic cable. Surprisingly, Europe has several layers of ocean, separated by different types of ice, formed at different depths and under different pressures. It is likely that in each of these layers, different life forms might be found. Species that have adapted to the particular conditions of the ocean stratum may exist. However, if these life forms turn out to be unlike anything we have seen on Earth, it might be difficult for us to recognize them. And besides, we might not find life there at all. But these thoughts wouldn't stop our curiosity, would they? Astonishing Pluto was discovered by astronomer Clyde Tombo in 1930, the ninth in order, when still a planet, 
was named in honor of the god of the underworld, Pluto. The planet's orbit takes the shape of an elongated ellipse with a significant slope of 17 degrees to the flat plane of motion of the other planets. A complete revolution around the Sun takes Pluto 247 years and intermittently, for periods of almost 20 years, it happens to be closer to the Sun than Neptune. Pluto's diameter is 2,374 kilometers. Pluto's mass is almost six times less than the mass of the Moon. It weighs 480 times less than the Earth, and its diameter is two-thirds that of the diameter of our natural satellite. Pluto's atmosphere is very thin and consists of gases evaporating from surface ice. This was perhaps all we knew about Pluto. However, on July 14, 2015, everything changed. On that day, the New Horizons space probe flew past Pluto at a speed of 50,000 km per hour. The flight to the destination took the spacecraft 9 years, 5 months and 27 days. In total, the craft covered more than 4.5 billion kilometers. Thanks to this mission, researchers have obtained high-quality images of Pluto and made many discoveries. Among other things, they have discovered cryovolcanoes on its surface, have postulated the existence of a subsurface ocean, and discoveries continue to be made to the present day. For example, the directors of the New Horizons mission finally managed to completely record and decipher the last portion of research data that had previously been obtained with the help of the super-powerful space telescope mounted on the probe. Indeed, we are hurrying to share it with you. It turns out that the subglacial oceans of Pluto are one of the most interesting places in the solar system from the standpoint of the existence of conditions for life are concerned, with the exception of Europa. However, so far very little is known about how they formed and what is happening in them under the multi-kilometer shell. But all the same, the results of the survey were a real surprise to the mission's directors. No one had imagined that distant Pluto would not look at all like a smooth billiard ball, but would have an extremely complex relief, reflecting the history of its origins. In the new images, Pluto turns out to be covered with recently formed mountains, ice plains, methane ice dunes, and even icebergs drifting through nitrogen. In addition to that, the ice crust of the celestial body is strewn with countless cracks that looked like traces of recent tectonic activity. They were the first indication of the existence of a giant subsurface ocean on this dwarf planet. Soon other evidence emerged supporting the presence of liquid water under the planet's icy crust. But how and when it originated on Pluto remains a mystery to this day. But we now know that at one time Pluto was originally cold. This means that it grew slowly, accumulating ice material from the outer solar system and at first there was no ocean on it. Water in liquid form only appeared on Pluto after the core of the dwarf planet warmed up as a result of the radioactive decay of aluminium-26 and gravitational interactions with its satellite, Charon. In this scenario, geologic faults in the celestial body would have retained signs of surface compression. Why compression specifically? The fact is that the heat emanating from the depth of the planet would melt the lower layers of the ice, turning it into liquid water, which as you know takes up less space. As a consequence, Pluto's ice crust would have begun to contract, which would lead to the formation of distinctive geological traces. And what have we learned about Pluto's atmosphere and climate? Pluto's atmosphere is predominantly composed of nitrogen, with minor traces of methane, ethene, ethylene and other gases. It is extremely thin, it has a pressure about 1,000 times less than that of the atmospheric pressure on Earth. Nonetheless, it has great influence not only on the climate, but also on the geology of the dwarf planet. For example, it facilitates the equalizing of the temperatures of the different regions of Pluto, and because of the greenhouse effect created by methane, the temperature of the planet's surface increases, 
Also, new data have demonstrated that some segments of the surface of the dwarf planet actually have snow caps, which are formed in a completely different way than they are on Earth. If on Earth, we are often able to observe the conversion of clouds into snow on mountaintops since temperature decreases with increasing altitude, then on Pluto, there is conceptually the inverse process. Since the atmosphere there becomes hotter as the altitude increases, correspondingly, the physiochemical traits of the process of the formation of snow and snow caps on Pluto differ dramatically. In this case, calling it methane ice is the most accurate conclusion. And finally, it turned out that the change of seasons on Pluto occurs not because of the tilt of the planet's axis of rotation as on the Earth, but is due to the elongated orbit over the course of a revolution around the Sun, which takes roughly 250 Earth years, the amount of heat received by Pluto changes almost three times. As a result, the density of the atmosphere fluctuates significantly. In the long summer, which lasts a little less than half of the Plutonian year, the frozen gases evaporate and in the winter they again revert to a solid state. They evaporate from the most brightly lit and warmed areas and settle in colder areas. This process ensures that gases are carried over the surface of the planet and over millions of years have sculpted the most amazing forms of relief. What comes next? New Horizons has raised more new questions for us than it has cleared up old ones. But most unfortunately, no new missions to Pluto are planned for the near future. So it will be a long time before we get new information comparable in value to that which was received from New Horizons.
one of the moons of Jupiter, known as Io, played a significant role in the advancement of 17th century astronomy. Studies had shown that in the process of crustal compression, about a hundred mountains were formed on the surface, changing the landscape over the next number of centuries. The peaks of some of these, for example South Busal Mons, exceed the height of Mount Everest twice over. Along these same lines, there are vast plains on the surface of this satellite. Its surface has unique properties and comprises an abundance of colors – white, red, black, green and even orange. This distinctive characteristic is due to regular lava flows which can stretch up to 500 kilometers. The high density indicates that there is virtually no water on this satellite, although there have been small pockets of water accumulation found. This deficiency of water is likely due to the fact that during the formation of the solar system, Jupiter was hot enough for volatile substances such as water to evaporate from Io's surrounding vicinity although not hot enough for this to happen on the more distant satellites. Correspondingly, often found on the satellite's surface are volcanic depressions, just like in humans, although they are called patterae. They are characterized by an even floor and steep walls. They very much resemble terrestrial calderas. However, it is still unknown whether they were formed by the collapse of the magma chamber and the collapse of the top of the volcano, like their terrestrial counterparts. Unlike similar geostructures on Earth and Mars, volcanic depressions on Io generally do not lie on top of shield volcanoes and are usually larger, with an average diameter of about 41 kilometers, and the largest, Loki Patera, is 202 kilometers in diameter. It is remarkable, but Patera often serve as sources of volcanic eruptions or far-spreading lava flows as in the case of an eruption in the Gishbar Patera, or they themselves fill with lava becoming lava lakes. The lava lakes on Io are covered by a lava crust, which crumbles away and renews continuously. Image analysis has shown that the lava flows on Io are primarily composed of molten sulfur. However, subsequent ground-based infrared observations indicate that the flows are, in fact, composed mainly of basaltic lava and ultra-basic rock. An outstanding representative is Masubi, an active volcano on this moon of Jupiter, which is located on Io's leading hemisphere, in the Taurus region. The volcano is noteworthy for one of the largest lava flows, both on Io and in the entire solar system, covering an area of 240 kilometers. Despite the extensive volcanism that characterizes Io's appearance, most of its mountains are not volcanic in origin. The majority of them are formed as a result of compressive stresses in the lithosphere, which lift and often tilt portions of the satellite's crust, thrusting them over each other, much like giant ice flows. This is precisely why virtually all of the mountains of Io are at some stage of destruction with large landslides being widespread at their bases. It appears that cave-ins are the main factor in the destruction of mountains. Believe it or not, but this tiny cheese ball, Io, plays an important role in shaping the magnetic field of the giant planet Jupiter. The magnetosphere of Jupiter absorbs gases and dust from the thin atmosphere of the satellite with a speed of one ton per second. All this matter depending on its composition and degree of ionization, ends up in the various neutral clouds and radiation belts of Jupiter's magnetosphere and sometimes even escapes Jupiter's system altogether. Also interesting is the fact that Io's moon is surrounded by a so-called atomic cloud of sulfur, oxygen, sodium and potassium, which extends to a distance from its surface equal to about six times its radius. These particles come from the upper atmosphere of the satellite and they are activated by collisions with particles from the plasma tours and other processes in Io's hill sphere, where its gravitational strength exceeds that of Jupiter's. 
Io's orbit ran its course within the radiation belt, known as the plasma torus, a donut-shaped ring of ionized sulfur, oxygen, sodium and chlorine. The plasma in it is formed from the neutral atoms of the cloud surrounding Io, which is ionized and carried away by Jupiter's magnetosphere. It's not hard to guess that Io is not at all like most satellites of the gas planets, which contain huge masses of ice, as it consists mainly of silicates and iron, like the inner planets. Further still, its interior is also incredibly active. Modeling of Io's internal composition shows that at least 75% of the mantle consists of the magnesium-rich mineral forsterite, a composition similar to that of alchondrite meteorites. It is obvious that the ratio of the concentrations of iron and silicon there is higher than those on the Moon or the Earth, but lower than on Mars. The latest research has shown the presence of an induced magnetic field on Io, for which an ocean of magma with a depth of 50 kilometers would be required. This layer is estimated to be 48 kilometers thick. It makes about 10% of Io's mantle, and its temperature reaches about 1200 degrees Celsius. It is not known whether this 15% melting is compatible with the conditions of significant amounts of molten silicates in this inconceivable ocean of magma. Io is a bright and wondrous world, which has no equivalent in the entire solar system. Active volcanism on a satellite the size of our moon is absolutely astounding, and the pioneering photographs of the satellite surface, which have been obtained by a number of spacecraft, compel us to plunge again and again into the atmosphere of this distant and mysterious world. A lone wanderer exploring the splendor of Saturn, its rings and moons, having spent a total of 20 years in space, 
Starting October 15, 1997, it voyaged on a long-duration seven-year journey, and on June 30, 2004, Cassini reached Saturn and went into orbit around the gas giant. For many years, astronomers around the world eagerly awaited the discoveries of the automatic interplanetary station. These were photographs of the numerous icy moons, dramatic photographs of the rings, and the unearthly patterns of the ever-changing and turbulent storms. A massive amount of data about the nature of a corner of the solar system far from us. But when the fuel reserves were running low on April 26, 2017, Cassini was assigned to carry out several last-ditch instructions to plunge between the rings of Saturn and the planet itself 22 times and then in order to safeguard the moons from danger on which there may be components of life. The craft was to become one with this amazing planet forever. The project's engineers sent Cassini into the interior of the gas giant and it kept its antenna pointed toward the Earth to the very end, transmitting its farewell words to the people of Earth. On September 15, 2017, Cassini disappeared forever into the clouds of Saturn. Heartling towards its death, Cassini, even while breaking up, continued to function, each of its devices diligently transmitting data as the craft burned up in the atmosphere. The heart of the station ceased to beat when the scientists pick up its last signal. It managed to accomplish all the maneuvers peerlessly. But what did it tell us in its grand finale, which lasted from April to September 2017? For more than 13 years, Cassini was our eyes and ears in the Saturn system. The planet has 82 moons, rings consisting of ice and stone particles. And what is more, it is impossible to accurately count the number of rings, because when the images that were taken at close range on the final flights are enlarged, you can see how they are divided into smaller ones, as though infinite. Astronomers sometimes refer to Saturn as a miniature solar system, because its many moons resemble planets, and the rings, the asteroid belt, and the Kuiper belt. Cassini fell through Saturn's atmosphere at a speed of 124,000 km per hour. I wouldn't have wanted to be on top of the space probe at that moment. After all, no one knew how long it would last, since the study of the interior of planet had not been the original intention of the scientists. Finding itself under the rings, Cassini snapped as many images of Saturn's clouds from as close as possible. But most of all, scientists were astounded by the giant hexagon, a huge hexagonal vortex, and more than that, one side of this hexagon is equal to the diameter of the Earth. It is present only at the North Pole of the planet, is comprised of thousands of smaller vortices, and in the very center of the hexagon is a giant funnel that goes deep into the bowels of Saturn for several hundred kilometers. The hexagon itself, depending upon the season, also changes color. It can be greenish, golden or blue, but the hexagon's shape remains stable and has lasted for hundreds of years. The seasons on Saturn change as on Earth due to the tilt of the planet's axis. When Saturn's North Pole is tilted towards the Sun, it receives more light. The sunlight interacts with the atmosphere and forms particulate matter, aerosols. It resembles smog, therefore it tints the hexagon with a golden-orange color. And when Saturn turns away from the Sun for the winter, the hexagon darkens. The central funnel is always a dark blue, regardless of the season, probably due to the fact that a mist of aerosol particles is drawn in there like a vacuum cleaner. The symmetrical shape of the hexagon is due to the interaction of the planet's rotation and atmospheric currents. At the end of its mission, during the closest approach, Cassini transmitted photographs of these roaming vortices one after another in excellent quality. But how old are the rings? Have they existed since the birth of the planet itself? Or did they appear recently? At the end of its mission, Cassini gave us the answer to this question. We were very fortunate not to miss out on this marvel of nature. 
they are only 10 to 100 million years old. And it is possible that at the end of the time of the dinosaurs on Earth, Saturn was not yet the Lord of the Rings, as they are too light and too bright. If they were ancient, they would have already long ago become covered with dust and turned much darker. Apparently, Saturn pulled an icy moon like Enceladus towards itself and its gravity destroyed it, tearing it into small pieces. They were dispersed into orbit, constantly colliding with each other, as a result of which they were shattered into small fragments and the sharp corners between them became smoothed out like pebbles on the seashore. Cassini showed that the thickness of the rings varies extremely. There are millions of rings, and between them there may be gaps, but the rings themselves look like a vinyl record. The only thing we need to do is to find an interplanetary scale record player. Yes, Cassini has died, but its legacy lives on and still excites. The final images of the hexagon, the discovery of freezing rain, the study of the appearing and disappearing vortices, and the discovery of Shepard satellites showed us that Saturn is a single system. Yes, by looks it seems beautiful and at the same time harsh, but this is an incredible world where everything is well balanced, from a small curl in the atmosphere to the finest specks of dust in the rings. Saturn is a unique creation of nature and Cassini showed us that the whole world of this giant planet rests on the delicate balance of gravity. Only unity and harmony could have created such a true masterpiece in the universe. These were Cassini's final words. Mars, by distance, is the fourth from the Sun, and by size, 
the seventh planet in the solar system. We have seen the unique landscape of Mars. The extinct Martian volcano, Olympus Mons, is the tallest mountain on the planet. And the Mariner Valley is its largest known canyon. And there is a huge number of impact craters. Mars has a rotational period and a change of seasons similar to the Earth. Nonetheless, relaxing under the palm trees, which don't exist here, isn't going to happen. The average temperature on Mars is minus 40 degrees Celsius. To this very day, we are receiving a huge amount of data, some of which we already want to share as early as in 2021. 1. Before you are the white clouds that occasionally appear in the upper layers of the atmosphere of Mars. And as we know, clouds do not form on their own. For their formation, something is required to help the water condense. For a long time, climate models simply could not explain how they could have formed at this sort of altitude. The process consists of what is known as meteorite smoke, whose burnt residue helps the water vapor condense and turn into small particles of ice. This discovery prompted the thought that the fine dust that rises into the atmosphere after the meteorite smoke may play a role in the creation of Martian clouds very similar to how glowing noctilucent clouds appear in the Earth massosphere. Two. Another interesting study draws attention. The analysis of 200 dry riverbeds showed that deep, wide rivers existed on the surface of Mars for an unexpectedly long time. This is because there were oceans of water on Mars, which contained almost as much liquid as our Arctic Ocean. This makes the history of the disappearance of the water extremely strange and inexplicable. On the other hand, some planetary scientists believe that even in ancient times, Mars might have been too cold and dry for the formation of oceans. Other researchers proposed that there was water on it, but it was only able to achieve a liquid state during times of volcanic eruptions or after the impacts of large asteroids from the asteroid belt. Three. Another interesting discovery was the glaciers of the Red Planet, which do not remain in one location, but move down the slopes of mountains or across the plains, retreating and advancing as the temperatures rise or fall. These movements of the ice do not occur without leaving a trace on the surface of the planet. Very distinct landforms appear on it, such as fjords, drumlins or rounded hills and other objects, which make it very clear that at one time a glacier existed here. Thanks to images from the MRO, or the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, over a period of several years, it was established that glaciers move in the form of massive streams at a speed of 300 to 800 meters per year. However, on the Tempe Terra, located to the north of the Tharsis volcanic plateau, the probe managed to find what are known as eskers, rather low and very long hills, similar in shape to railway embankments. Eskers, unlike many other glacial landforms, are formed not as a result of the movement of the ice itself, but rather of the meltwater flows, which spring out from between the edge of the foot of the glacier and the ground, and carve narrow but long channels, tens of kilometers in length. Four. The so-called Noctis Labyrinthus, or Labyrinth of Night, is also worth pointing out. We have heard about it more than once. However, there is something that's brand new. Yes, this is an amazing place, but I still wouldn't want to go there. It turns out that in the past, this canyon was one of the deepest gorges on Mars, which was filled with volcanic lakes. Studying the images of these canyons, researchers came across hundreds and thousands of dark lines, similar to those they had seen five years ago in the high latitudes of Mars. 
The appearance of these lines, judging by the images, led to large-scale changes in the appearance of the surface of the mariner valleys. According to calculations, their appearance indicates that the soil of Mars in this region held or absorbed about a million cubic meters of water. Five, let's turn our attention to what are known as the sand spiders of Mars. No, they won't eat the settlers for a snack. They aren't that kind of spiders. But some things we know for sure are that Mars, just like the Earth, has its own weather, system of air currents and climate. And these canyons, or spiders, as observations have shown, are constantly increasing in size. What causes them to grow? Actually, Martian sand dunes and deposits of dry ice, the frozen carbon dioxide that covered the dunes, facilitate the formation of these landforms. In the summer and springtime, when the air and soil temperatures on Mars sharply increase, a portion of the ice warms and melts. As a result, the dry ice turns into carbon dioxide, a giant bubble of gas appears under the surface of the glacier, and the pressure in it increases. After some time it reaches a critical point, the ice bursts open and the CO2 is ejected into the atmosphere of Mars through the fracture. Together with the gas, the massive amount of sand falls onto the surface of the dust-covered ice, which due to the high pressure, turns this air geyser into a sort of sandblasting machine, stripping away the surface. Therefore, the cracks through which the gas escapes grow each season and turn into the giant spiders which can be seen in the MRO, or the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter images. It's difficult to come to grips with the fact that four billion years ago, Mars probably resembled the Earth. That means its vast expanses were most likely covered with a shallow ocean, perhaps several hundred meters deep, but not kilometers, as on the Earth. Clearly, there was water. There is already no doubt about that. However, billions and billions of years passed, and Mars rapidly died, becoming cold and losing almost all of its atmosphere.
The Andromeda Nebula has been known to man since ancient times. The first to notice it were the Chaldean priests, astronomers of the ancient world. At some point in the past, the Andromeda galaxy was the spitting image of our home, the Milky Way. But with the development of astronomy, this myth was dispelled. It turned out that the Milky Way and Andromeda belonged to different subclasses of spiral galaxies, and the configuration of their arms is quite different. But nonetheless, they still have a lot in common. For example, an appetite for devouring their dwarf satellite galaxies. Their internal structure is also similar. The Andromeda Galaxy, also known as M31, looks like a spiral, the lines of the arms of which being evenly dispersed around the spherical bulge, the central, bright part of the galaxy, which consists mainly of old, bright stars moving in extensive, elongated orbits. The Milky Way today, on the other hand, is assumed to be a galaxy of the SBBC classification, a barred, spiral galaxy. The difference between our galaxy and M31 lies precisely in the bar. This is the portion that extends from the edges of the bulge and connects it to the arms. The nucleus of the Andromeda galaxy, like the nuclei of many other galaxies in the universe, has candidates located in them that have the potential to become supermassive black holes. Based on the results of calculations, the size of such an object could exceed that of up to 140 million times the mass of our Sun. In addition, the Hubble telescope discovered a mysterious disk which contained young blue stars surrounding supermassive black holes. They revolve around a relativistic object in exactly the same way planetary bodies do around their stars. Astronomers are a bit puzzled by how this kind of a disk could form so close to such a huge object. According to calculations, the enormous tidal forces of supermassive black holes should limit the gas and dust clouds from coalescing and forming new stars. Well, further observations will likely provide us with clues to this mystery. According to rough estimates, the Milky Way may contain between 100 and 400 billion stars. But this is nothing compared to Andromeda, which may contain about a trillion. Thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, among this trillion, scientists have learned about the presence of a very large and sparse population of hot and bright stars. Hot young stars tend to appear blue. However, the blue stars found in the Andromeda galaxy appear to be growing old, more like the Sun. Stars that have burned out their inner layers and are revealing their hot blue cores. They are scattered all across the center of the galaxy and are the brightest in the ultraviolet range. Besides that, there are other interesting objects located in the core of M31. Along these lines, a double or a binary cluster of stars was discovered in the center of Andromeda galaxy. This discovery turned out to be highly prized by the astronomical community, since the merging of the two clusters into one could happen over a fairly short period of time, roughly in about a hundred thousand years. Based on calculations, astronomers have determined that the merging should have happened millions of years ago. However, due to some strange and still inexplicable reasons, it did not happen. According to one hypothesis, there may not be a double cluster at all in the middle of M31, but rather something like a ring, consisting of old red stars. The ring might look like two clusters, because when observing, we only see the stars from the opposite side. The ring of the disk is turned to our galaxy on one side, from which it can be concluded that there is a certain interrelation between them. When studying the center of the Andromeda galaxy using the XMM-Newton telescope, 
A group of astronomers also discovered 63 discrete sources with X-ray emissions. Most of them, that being 46 objects, have been identified as binary X-ray stars, whereas other objects are acting as neutron stars or candidates for black holes from binary systems. About 460 globular clusters have also been registered in the galaxy. The most massive of them, Mayal 2 or G1, has a luminosity greater than that of any cluster in the local group. It is even brighter than the brightest cluster in the Milky Way, Omega Centauri. It is located at a distance of about 130,000 light years from the center of M31 galaxy and mainly consists of about 300,000 old stars. Similarly, the PA 99N2 star is located in Andromeda, around which orbits the exoplanet, which is the first to be discovered outside the Milky Way. But as it stands today, the planet is still considered to be unconfirmed. However, in view of the scale of the Andromeda system, the presence of so many stars in it and an even larger number of planets, it is quite possible, at least according to the logic of the theory of probability, that among this abundance of planets, there are planets that are quite suitable for life, or already have life on them. After hundreds of thousands of years, we will be able to see everything much better, given the fact that a collision of the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way is inevitable. Mind you, this will happen in about 4 billion years. We'll be substantially older. Well, we tried to put together all the most interesting facts about our celestial neighbor. If you want to find the Andromeda galaxy in the night sky, then the best time to observe it is the autumn and the winter. In a dark sky out of town, it will be visible to the naked eye. What's interesting is that because of the finite speed of light, we are seeing this object as it was two and a half million years ago. Shall we say two and a half million years ago on Earth, there were no representatives yet of the modern human species. Unfortunately, according to the theory of special relativity, there is no way to know what this galaxy looks like at the present moment, given that what we see is for us the present moment.